Section 13 of The Golden Bough, Part 3, The Dying God, by Sir James George Fraser. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 8. The Killing of the Tree Spirit, Part 2. Part 5. Sawing the Old Woman. Sawing the Old Woman at Mid-Lent in Italy. The custom of sawing the old woman, which is or used to be observed in Italy, France and Spain on the fourth Sunday in Lent, is doubtless, as Grimm supposes, merely another form of the custom of carrying out death. A great hideous figure representing the oldest woman of the village was dragged out and sawn in two, amid the prodigious noise made with cowbells, pots and pans and so forth. In Palermo, the representation used to be still more lifelike, and mid-Lent, an old woman was drawn through the streets on a cart, attended by two men dressed in the costume of the Compagnia de Bianchi, a society or religious order whose function it was to attend to console prisoners condemned to death. A scaffold was erected in a public square. The old woman mounted it, and two mock executioners proceeded, amid a storm of huzzas and hand-clapping, to saw through her neck, or rather through a bladder of blood which had been previously fitted to it. The blood gushed out, and the old woman pretended to swoon and die. The last of these mock executions took place in 1737. In Florence during the 15th and 16th centuries, the old woman was represented by a figure stuffed with walnuts and dried figs and fastened at the top of a ladder. At mid-Lent, this effigy was sawn through the middle under the loggi of Mercato Nuovo, and as the dried fruits tumbled out, they were scrambled forward by the crowd. A trace of the custom is still to be seen in the practice, observed by urchins, of secretly pinning paper ladders to the shoulders of women of the lower classes who happen to show themselves in the streets in the morning of mid-Lent. A similar custom is observed by urchins in Rome, and in Naples on the 1st of April, boys cut strips of cloth into the shape of sores, smear them with gypsum, and strike passers-by with their sores on the back, thus imprinting the figure of a sore upon their clothes. At Montello and Calabria, Boys go about in Midland with little saws made of cane and jeer at old people, who therefore generally stay indoors on that day. The Calabrian women meet together at this time and feast on figs, chestnuts, honey, and so forth. This they call sawing the old woman, a reminiscence probably of a custom like the old Florentine one. In Lombardy, the Thursday of Midland is known as the Day of the Old Wives, Il Giorno delle Vecchi. The children run about crying out for the oldest woman whom they wish to burn, and failing to possess themselves of the original, they make a puppet representing her, which in the evening is consumed on a bonfire. On the lake of Gardia, a blaze of light flaring at different points on the hills produces a picturesque effect. Sawing the Old Woman at Midland in France In Berry, a region of central France, the custom of sawing the old woman at Midland used to be popular has probably not wholly died out even now. Here the name of Fairs of the Old Wives was given to certain fairs held in Lent, at which children were made to believe that they would see the old woman at mid-Lent split or sawn asunder. At Argentin and Clustisius, when mid-Lent has come, the children of ten or twelve years of age scour the streets with wooden swords, pursue the old crones whom they meet, and even try to break into the houses where ancient dames are known to live. Passers-by who see the children thus engaged say they are going to cut or save with the old woman. Meantime, the old wives take care to keep out of sight as much as possible. When the children of Cluestesius have gone around their rounds, and the day draws towards evening, they repair to Cluestesius, whom they mount a rude figure of an old woman out of clay, hew it in pieces with their wooden swords, and throw the bits into the river. A ball goes on the same day, an effigy representing an old woman was formerly sewn in two on the cryer's stone in a public square. About the middle of the 19th century, in the same town, on the same day, hundreds of children assembled at the hospital to see the old women split or divided in two. A religious service was held in the building on this occasion, which attracted many idlers. In the streets, it was not uncommon to hear cries of, Let us cleave the old wife. Let us cleave the oldest woman of the ward. At Tuel, on the day of mid-Lent, the people used to inquire after the oldest woman in the town, and to tell the children 
that at midday, punctually, she was to be sawn in two at Pouet St. Clair. Sawing the old woman at mid-Lent in Spain and among the Slavs. In Barcelona on the fourth Sunday in Lent, boys run about the streets, some with saws, others with billets of wood, others again with cloths in which they collect gratitudes. They sing a song in which it is said that they are looking for the oldest woman of the city for the purpose of sawing her in two in honour of mid-Lent. At last, pretending to have found her, they saw something in two and burn it. A like custom is found among the South Slavs. In Lent, the crowds tell their children that at noon an old woman is being sawn in two outside the gate. And in Carniola, also the saying is current, that at mid-Lent an old woman is taken out of the village and sawn in two. The North Slavonian expression for keeping mid-Lent is Baburizati, that is, sawing the old wife. In Graubünden, Canton of Switzerland, on Invokovit Sunday, grown people used to assemble in the old house, and there saw into a straw puppet which they called Mrs. Winter or the Ugly Woman, Bagoda, while the children in the streets tease each other with wooden saws. Saw in the Old Woman on Palm Sunday among the Gypsies. Among the gypsies of southeastern Europe, the custom of sawing the old woman in two is observed in a very graphic form, not at mid-Lent, but on the afternoon of Palm Sunday. The old woman, represented by a puppet of straw dressed in women's clothes, is laid across a beam on some open place and beaten with clubs by the assembled gypsies, after which it is sawn in two by a young man and maiden, both of whom wear a disguise. While the effigy is being sawn through, the rest of the company dance around it, singing songs of various sorts. The remains of the figure are finally burnt and the ashes thrown into a stream. The ceremony is supposed by the gypsies themselves to be observed in honour of a certain shadow queen. Hence Palm Sunday goes by the name of Shadow Day among all of the strolling gypsies of Eastern and Southern Europe. According to the popular belief, this shadow queen, of whom the gypsies of today have only a very vague and confused conception, vanishes underground at the appearance of spring but comes forth again at the beginning of winter to plague mankind during the inclement season with sickness, hunger and death. Among the vagrant gypsies of southern Hungary, the effigy is regarded as an expiatory and thank-offering made to the Shadow Queen, having spared the people during the winter. In Transylvania, the gypsies who live in tents clothe the puppet in the cuffs of garments of the woman who has last become a widow. The widow herself gives the clothes gladly for this purpose because she thinks that, being burnt, they will pass into the possession of her departed husband, who will thus have no excuse for returning from the spirit land to visit her. The ashes are thrown by the Transylvanian gypsies on the first graveyard they pass on their journey. In this gypsy custom, the equivalence of the effigy of the old woman to the effigy of death in the customs we have just been considering comes out very clearly, thus strongly confirming the opinion of Grimm that the practice of Sawing the old woman is only another form of the practice of carrying out death. Seven Legged Evigies of Lent in Spain The same perhaps may be said of a somewhat different form, which the custom assumes in parts of Spain and Italy. In Spain it is sometimes usual on Ash Wednesday to fashion an effigy of stucco or pasteboard representing a hideous old woman with seven legs, wearing a crown of sorrel and spinach and holding a sceptre in her hand. The seven skinny legs stand for the seven weeks of the Lenten fast, which begins on Ash Wednesday. This monster, proclaimed Queen of Lent, amid the chanting of lugubrious songs, is carried in triumph through the crowded streets and public places. On reaching the principal square, the people put out their torches, cease shouting and disperse. Their revels are now ended and they take a vow to hold no more merry meetings until all the legs of the old woman have fallen one by one and she has been beheaded. The effigy is then deposited in some place appointed for the purpose, where the public is admitted to see it during the whole event. Every week on Saturday evening, one of the queen's legs is pulled off, and on Holy Saturday, when from every church, tower, the joyous clangor of the bells proclaims the glad tidings that Christ is risen. The mutilated body of the fallen queen is carried with great solemnity to the principal square and publicly beheaded. Seven-legged effigies of Lent in Italy A custom of the same sort prevails in various parts of Italy. Thus, in the, in the Abruzzi, they hang a puppet of tau, 
representing Lent to a cord, which stretches across the street from one window to another. Seven feathers are attached to the figure, and in its hand it grasps a distaff and spindle. Every Saturday in Lent, one of the seven feathers is plucked out, and on Holy Saturday, while the bells are ringing, a string of chestnuts is burnt for the purpose of sending Lent to its meaning of fair to the devil. In houses, too, it is usual to amuse children by cutting the figure of an old woman with seven legs out of pasteboard and sticking it beside the chimney. The old woman represents Lent, and her seven legs are the seven weeks of the fast. Every Saturday, one of the legs is amputated. At mid-Lent, the effigy is cut through the middle, and the part of which the feet have been already amputated is removed. Sometimes the figure is stuffed with sweets, dried fruits, and halfpence, which the street urchins scramble when the puppet is bisected. In the Sorrentine Peninsula, Lent is similarly represented by the effigy of a wrinkled old hag with a spindle and a staff, which is fastened to a balcony or a window. Attached to the vigour is an orange, with as many feathers stuck into it as there are weeks in Lent. At the end of each week, one of the feathers is plucked out. At mid-Lent, the puppet is sawn in two, an operation which is sometimes intended by a gush of blood from a bladder concealed in the interior of their figure. Any old women who show themselves in the streets on that day are exposed to jibes and jests, and may be warned that they ought to remain at home. At Castellamare, to the south of Naples, an English lady observed a rude puppet dangling from a stream which spanned one of the narrow streets of the old town, being fastened at either end, high overhead to the upper part of the many-storied houses. The puppet, about a foot long, was dressed in black, rather like a nun, and from the skirts projected five or six feathers which bore a certain resemblance to legs. A peasant being asked what these things meant, replied with Italian vagueness, it is only Lent. Further inquiries, however, elicited the information that at the end of every week in Lent, one of the feathered legs was pulled off the puppet, and that the puppet was finally destroyed on the last day of Lent. Part 6. Bringing in Summer The custom of carrying out death is often followed by the ceremony of bringing in summer, in which the summer is represented by a tree or branches. In the preceding ceremonies, the return of spring, summer or life, as a sequel to the expulsion of death, is only implied or most announced. In the following ceremonies, it is plainly enacted. As in some parts of Bohemia, the effigy of death is drowned by being thrown into the water at sunset. Then the girls go out into the wood and cut down a young tree with a green crown, hang a doll dressed as a woman on it, deck the whole with green, red, and white ribbons, and march in procession with a little summer into the village, collecting gifts and singing. Death swims in the water. Spring comes to visit us, with eggs that are red, with yellow pancakes. We carry death out of the village. We are carrying summer into the village. In many Silesian villages, the figure of death, after being treated with respect, is stripped of its clothes and flung with curses into the water, or torn to pieces in a field. Then the young folk repair to a wood, cut down a small fir tree, peel the trunk and deck it with festoons of evergreens, paper roses, painted eggshells, motley bits of cloth, and so forth. The tree thus adorned is called Summer or May. Boys carry it from house to house, singing appropriate songs and begging for presents. Among their songs is as follows. We have carried death out. We are bringing the dear summer back. The summer and the May, and all the flowers gay. Sometimes they also bring back from the wood a prettily adorned figure which goes by the name of Summer, May, or the Bride. In the Polish districts, it's called Zywana, the goddess of spring. At Eisenach, on the fourth Sunday in Lent, young people used to fasten a straw man representing death to a wheel, which they trundled to the top of a hill. Then setting fire to the figure, they allowed it and the wheel to roll down the slope. Next they cut a tall fir tree, tricked it out with ribbons, and set it up in the plain. The men then climbed the tree to fetch down the ribbons. In Upper Lusetia, the figure of death, made of straw and rags, is dressed in a veil furnished by the last bride and a shirt provided by the house in which the last death took place. Thus arrayed, the figure is struck on the end of a long pole and carried at full speed by the tallest and strongest girl, while the rest pull the effigy with sticks and stones. Whoever hits it will be sure to live through the year. 
In this way, death is carried out to the village and thrown into the water or over the boundary of the next village. On the way home, each one breaks a green branch and carries it gaily with him till he reaches the village, when he throws it away. Sometimes young people of the next village, on whose land the figure has been thrown, run after them and hurl it back, not wishing to have death among them. Hence the two parties occasionally come to blows. New potency of life ascribed to the image of death. In these cases, death is represented by the puppet which is thrown away. Some are alive by the branches or trees which are brought back. But sometimes a new potency of life seems to be attributed to the image of death itself, and by a kind of resurrection, it becomes the instrument of the general revival. Thus, in some parts of Lusatia, women alone are concerned in carrying out death and suffer no amount of metal with it. Attired in mourning, which they wear the whole day, they make a puppet of store, clothed in a white shirt, and give it a broom in one hand and a scythe in the other. Singing songs and pursued by urchins throwing stones, they carry the puppet to the village boundary, where they tear it to pieces. Then they cut down a fine tree, hang a shirt on it, and carry it home singing. Carrying out death at Brelia in Transylvania On the feast of Ascension, the Saxons of Brelia, a village of Transylvania, not far from Hermannstadt, observe the ceremony of carrying out death in the following manner. After morning service, all the schoolgirls repair to the house of one of their number, and there dress up the death. This is done by tying a threshed-out sheaf of corn into a rough semblance of a head and body, while the arms are simulated by a broomstick thrust through it horizontally. The figure is dressed in the holiday attire of a young peasant woman, with a red hood, silver brooches and a profusion of ribbons at the arms and breast. The girls bustle at their work, for soon the bells will be ringing to vespers, and the desk must be ready in time to be placed at the open window that all the people may see it on their way to church. When vespers are over, the long for moment has come for the first procession of the death to begin. It is a privilege that belongs to the schoolgirls alone. Two of the older girls seize the figure by the arms and walk in front. All the rest follow two and two. Boys may take no part in the procession, but... They troop after it, gazing with open-mouthed admiration at the beautiful death. So the procession goes through all the streets of the village, the girls singing the old hymn that begins, Gott mein Vater, den lieb, Rick so wit, der Himmel ist. To a tune that differs from the ordinary one, when the procession is well on its way through every street, the girls go to another house, having shut the door against the eager praying crowd of boys who follow at their heels. They strip the death, and pass a naked truss of straw out of the window to the boys, who pounce on it, run out of the village with it without singing, and fling the dilapidated effigy into the neighbouring brook. This done, the second scene of the little drama begins. While the boys were carrying away the death out of the village, the girls remained in the house, and one of them is now dressed in all the finery which has been worn by the effigy. Thus arrayed, she is led in procession through all the streets to the scene in the same hymn as before. When the procession is over, they all betake themselves to the house of the girl who played the leading part. Here a feast awaits them, from which also the boys are excluded. It's a popular belief that the children may safely begin to eat gooseberries and other fruit after the day on which death has thus been carried out. For death, which up to that time lurked especially in gooseberries, is now destroyed. Further, they may now bathe with impunity out of doors. Very similar is the ceremony which, down to recent years, was observed in some of the German villages of Moravia. Boys and girls met on the afternoon of the first Sunday after Easter, and together fashioned a puppet of straw to represent death, decked with bright coloured ribbons and clothes, and fastened to the top of a log pole. The effigy was then borne with singing and clamour to the nearest height, where it was stripped of its gay attire and thrown a roll down the slope. One of the girls was next dressed in the gourds taken from the effigy of death, and with her at its head, the procession moved back to the village. In some villages, the practice is to bury the effigy in the place that it has the most evil reputation of all the countryside. Others throw it into the running water. Life-giving virtue ascribed to the effigy of death. In the Lusatian ceremony described above, the tree which is brought home after the destruction of the figure of death is plainly equivalent to the trees or branches which, in the preceding customs, were brought back as representatives of summer or life, after death had been thrown away or destroyed. 
by the transference of the shirt worn by the effigy of death to the tree clearly in the case of the tree is a kind of revivification in a new form of the destroyed effigy this comes out also in the transylvanian and moravian customs the dressing of a girl in the clothes worn by the death and the leading her about the village to the same song which had been sung when the death was being carried about show that she is intended to be a kind of resuscitation of the being whose effigy has just been destroyed these examples therefore suggest that the death whose demolition is represented in these ceremonies cannot be regarded as a purely destructive agent which we understand by death if the tree which is brought back as an embodiment of the reviving vegetation of spring is clothed in the shirt worn by death which has just been destroyed the object certainly cannot be to check and encounter of the revival of vegetation it can only be to foster and promote it therefore the being which has just been destroyed the so-called death must be supposed to be endowed with a vivifying and quickening influence which it can communicate with the vegetable and even the animal world this description of a life-giving virtue to the figure of death is put beyond a doubt by the custom observed in some places of taking pieces of the straw energy of death and placing them in the fields to make the crops grow or in the manger to make the cattle thrive thus in Speckendorf, a village of Austrian Silesia. The figure of death made of straw, brushed wooden rags, is carried with wild songs to an open place outside the village and they're burned. And while it is burning, a general struggle takes place for the pieces, which are pulled out of the flames with bare hands. Each one who secures a fragment of the effigy ties it to a branch of the largest tree in his garden, or buries it in his field, in the belief that this causes the crops to grow better. In the Trapau district of Austrian Silesia, the store of figure which the boys make on the fourth Sunday in Lent is dressed by the girls in woman's clothes and hung with ribbons, necklace, and garlands. Attached to a long pole, it is carried out of the village, followed by a trip of young people of both sexes, who alternately frolic, lament, and sing songs. Arrived at its destination, a field outside the village, the figure is stripped of its clothes and ornaments, then the crowd rushes at it and tears it to bits, scuffling for the fragments. Everyone tries to get a wisp of the straw of which the effigy was made, because such a wisp, placed in the manger, is believed to make the cattle thrive, or the straw is brought in the hen's nest. It being supposed that this prevents the hens from carrying away their eggs, and makes them brood much better. The same attribution of a fertilizing power to the figure of death appears in the belief that if the bearer of the figure, after throwing it away, beat cattle with their sticks, this would render the beast fat or prolific. Perhaps the sticks had been previously used to beat the death, and so it acquired the fertilizing power ascribed to the effigy. We have seen, too, that at Leipzig, a straw effigy of death was shown to young wives to make them fruitful. The Summer Tree Equivalent to the May Tree It seems hardly possible to separate from the May Trees, the trees or branches which are brought into the village after the destruction of the death. The bearers who bring them in profess to be bringing in the summer. Therefore, the trees obviously represent the summer. Indeed, in Silesia, they are commonly called the summer or the May. And the doll, which is sometimes attached to the summer tree, is a duplicate representative of the summer, just as the May is sometimes represented in the same time by a May tree and a May lady. Further, the summer trees are adorned like May trees with ribbons and so on. Like May trees when large, they are planted in the ground and climbed upon, and like may trees when small, they are carried from door to door by boys or girls singing songs and collecting money. And as if to demonstrate the identity of the two sets of customs, the bearers of the summer trees sometimes announce that they are bringing in the summer and the may. The customs, therefore, of bringing in the may and bringing in the summer are essentially the same, and the summer tree is merely another form of the may tree. The only distinction besides that of name, being in the time at which they are respectively brought in. For while the May tree is usually fetched in on the 1st of May, or at with suntide, the summer tree is fetched in on the 4th Sunday in Lent. Therefore, if the May tree is an embodiment of the tree spirit, or spirit of vegetation, the summer tree must likewise be an embodiment of the tree spirit, or spirit of vegetation. But the summer tree is a revival of the image of death, hence the image of death must be an embodiment of the spirit of vegetation.
But we have seen that the cemetery is in some cases a revification of the effigy of death. It follows, therefore, that in these cases, the effigy called death must be an embodiment of the true spirit or spirit of vegetation. Its inference is confirmed, first by the vivifying and fertilizing influence which the fragments of the effigy of death are believed to exercise both on vegetable and on animal life. For this influence, as we saw in the first part of the world, is supposed to be a special attribute of the tree spirit. It is confirmed, secondly, by observing that the effigy of death is sometimes decked with leaves or made of twigs, branches, hemp, or a threshed-out sheaf of corn, and that sometimes it is hung on a little tree and so carried about by girls collecting money, just as is done with a may tree, a may lady, and with the summer tree and doll attached to it. In short, we are driven to regard the expulsion of death and the bringing in of summer, as in some cases at least, merely another form of that death and revival of the spirit of vegetation in spring which we saw enacted in the killing and resurrection of the wild man. The burial and resurrection of the carnival is probably another way of expressing the same idea. The instrument of the representation of the carnival under a dung heap is natural, if he is supposed to possess a quickening and fertilizing influence like that ascribed to the effigy of death. The Estonians, indeed, who carry the store figure out of the village in the usual way, on Shrove Tuesday, do not call it the carnival, but the wood spirit, Metzik, and they clearly indicate the identity of the effigy with the wood spirit by fixing it to the top of the tree in the wood, where it remains for a year, and is besought almost daily with prayers and offerings to protect the herds. For like a true wood spirit, the Metzik is a patron of cattle. Sometimes the Metzik is made of sheaves of corn. The names of carnival, death and summer and preceding customs seem to cover an ancient tree spirit or spirit of vegetation. Thus we may fairly conjecture that the names carnival, death and summer are comparatively late and inadequate expressions for the beings personified or embodied in the customs with which we have been dealing. The very abstractness of the names bespeaks a modern origin. For the personification of times and seasons like the carnival and summer, or of an abstract notion like death, is highly primitive. But the ceremonies themselves bear the stamp of a dateless antiquity. Therefore we can hardly help supposing that in their origin the ideas which they embodied were of a more simple and concrete order. The notion of a tree, perhaps of a particular kind of tree, for some savages had no word for tree in general, or even of an individual tree, is sufficiently concrete to supply a basis from which, by a gradual process of generalization, the wider idea of a spirit of vegetation might be reached. But this general idea of vegetation would really be confounded with the season in which it manifests itself, hence the substitution of spring, summer or May, for the true spirit or spirit of vegetation will be easy and natural. Again, the concrete notion of the dying tree or dying vegetation would, by a similar process of generalization, glide into a notion of death in general. So the practice of carrying out the dying or dead vegetation in spring as a preliminary to its revival would in time widen out in an attempt to banish death in general from the village or district. The view that in these spring ceremonies death meant originally the dying or dead vegetation of winter has a high support of W. Manhart, and he confirms it by the analogy of the same death as applied to the spirit of the ripe corn. Commonly, the spirit of the ripe corn is conceived not as dead, but as old, and as it goes by the name of the old man or the old woman. But in some places, the last sheaf cut at harvest, which is generally believed to be the seat of the corn spirit, is called the dead one. Children are warned against entering the cornfields because death sits in the corn, and in a game played by Saxon children in Transylvania, at the maize harvest, death is represented by a child clearly covered with maize leaves. Part 7. Battle of Summer and Winter Dramatic Contest Between Representatives of Summer and Winter Sometimes in the popular customs of the peasantry, the contrast between the dormant powers of vegetation in winter and their awakening vitality in spring takes the form of dramatic contest between actors who play the parts respectively of winter and summer. Thus in the towns of Sweden on May Day, two troops of young men on horseback used to meet as if for mortal combat. One of them was led by a representative of winter clad in furs, who threw snowballs and ice in order to prolong the cold weather. 
The other troop was commanded by a representative of summer covered with fresh leaves and flowers. In the sham fight which followed, the party of summer came off victorious, and the ceremony ended with a feast. Again in the region of the Middle Rhine, a representative of summer, clad in ivy, combats a representative of winter, clad in straw moss, and finally gains a victory over him. The vanquished foe is thrown to the ground and stripped of his casing of straw, which is torn to pieces and scattered about, while the youthful comrades of the two champions sing a song to commemorate the defeat of winter by summer. Afterwards they carry about a summer garland or branch and collect gifts of eggs and bacon from house to house. Sometimes the champion who acts the part of summer is dressed in leaves and flowers and wears a chaplet of flowers on his head. In the Palatinate, this mimic conflict takes place on the fourth Sunday in Lent. All over Bavaria, the same drama used to be acted on the same day, and it was still kept up in some places down to the middle of the 19th century or later. While summer appeared clad all in green, decked with flattering ribbons, and carrying a branch and blossom or a little tree hung with apples and pears, winter was muffled up in cap and mantle of fur, and bore in his hand a snow shovel or a flail. Accompanied by their respective retunes, dressed in corresponding attire, they went through all the streets of the village, holding before their houses and singing staves of old songs, for which they received presents of bread, eggs and fruit. Finally, after a short struggle, winter was beaten by summer and ducked in the village well, or driven out of the village with shouts and laughter into the forest. In some parts of Bavaria, the boys who play the parts of winter and summer at the little drama in every house that they visit, and engage in a war of words before they come to blows, each of them vaulting the pleasures and benefits of the season he represents, and disparaging those of the other. The dialogue is in verse. A few couplets may serve as specimens. Summer. Green, green are meadows where I pass, and the mowers are busy among the grass. Winter. White, white are the meadows wherever I go, and the sledges glide hissing across the snow. Summer. I'll climb up the tree where the red cherries glow, and winter can stand by himself down below. Winter. With you I will climb the cherry tree tall, its branches will kindle the fire in the hall. Summer. A winter you are most uncivil, to send our women to the devil. Winter. By that I make them warm and mellow, so let them bawl and let them bellow. Summer. I am summer in white array. I am chasing the winter far, far away. Winter. I am winter in mantle of furs. I am chasing the summer over bushes and burrs. Summer. Just say a word more and I'll have you banned. At once and forever from a summer land. Winter. O oh, summer, for all your bluster and brag, you would not dare to carry a hen in a bag. Summer. O oh, winter, your chatter no more can I stay. I'll kick and I'll cut you off without delay. Here ensues a scuffle between the two little boys, in which summer gets the best of it, and turns winter out of the house. But soon the beaten champion of winter peeps in at the door and says a humble and crestfallen air. O oh, summer, do summer, I'm my dear band, for you are the master and I am the man. To which summer replies, Tis a capital motion and excellent plan, if I am the master and you are the man. So come, my dear winter, and give me your hand, we'll travel together to summer land. Dramatic contest between representatives of summer and winter. At Gorbfritz in Lower Austria, two men personating summer and winter used to go from house to house on Shrove Tuesday and were every welcomed by the children of great delight. The representative of summer was clad in white and bore a sickle. His comrade who played the part of winter had a fur cap on his head. His arms and legs were swathed in straw, and he carried a flail. In every house they sang verses alternately. A drumling in Brunswick, down to the present time, the contest between summer and winter is acted every year, and with sun tied by a troop of boys and a troop of girls. The boys rush singing, shouting, and ringing bells from house to house to drive winter away. After them come the girls, singing softly and led by a May bride. All in bright dresses, and decked with flowers and garlands to represent the general advent of spring. Formerly the part of winter was played by a straw man, which the boys carried with them. Now it is acted by a real man disguised. In Wachtel and Brodeck, a German village at a little German town of Moravia, encompassed by a Slavonic people on every side. The great change that comes over the earth in spring is still annually mimicked. 
the long village of Wachtel, with its trim houses and farmyards, nestles in a valley surrounded by petty pine woods. Here in ordained spring, about the time of the vernal equinox, an early man with a long flaxen beard may be seen going from door to door. He is muffled in furs, with warm gloves in his hands, and a bearskin cap on his head, and he carries a threshing flail. This is the personification of winter. With him goes a young, beardless man, dressed in white, wearing a straw hat trimmed with gay ribbons on his head, and carrying a decorated may tree in his hands. This is summer. At every house they receive a friendly greeting and recite a long dialogue in verse. Winter punctuating his discourse with his flail, which he brings down with rude vigour on the backs of all within reach. Amongst the Slavonic population near Ankarish Brod, in Moravia, the ceremony took a somewhat different form. Girls dressed in green marched in procession round a may tree. Then two others, one in white and one in green, stepped up on the tree and engaged in a dialogue. Finally, the girl in white was driven away, but returned afterwards clothed in green, and the festival ended with a dance. Queen of Winter and Queen of May in the Isle of Man On May Day used to be customary in almost all the large parishes on the Isle of Man to choose from among the daughters of the wealthiest farmers a young maiden to be Queen of May. She was dressed in the gayest attire and attended by about twenty others who were called Maids of Honour. She had also a young man for her captain with a number of inferior officers under him. In opposition to her was the Queen of Winter, a man attired as a woman, with woolen hoods, fur tippets, and loaded with the warmest and heaviest clothes once upon another. Her attendants were habitated in like manner, and she too had a captain and true her defence. Thus representing respectively the beauty of spring and the deformity of winter, they set forth from their different quarters, the one preceded by the dulcet music of flutes and violins, the other by the harsh clatter of cleavers and tongs. In this array they marched till they met on the common, where the trains of the two mimic sovereigns engaged in a mock battle. If the Queen of Winter's forces got the better of their adversaries and took a rival prisoner, the captive Queen of Summer was ransomed for as much as would pay the expenses of the festival. Out of this ceremony, Winter and her company retired and averred themselves in a barn where the partisans of summer danced on the green, concluding the evening with a feast, at which the queen and her maids sat at one table, and the captain and his troop at another. At later times the person of the queen of May was exempt from capture, but one of her slippers was substituted, and if captured had to be ransomed to defray the expenses of the pageant. The procession of the summer, which was subsequently composed of little girls and called the MacBoard, outlived that of its rival, the winter for some years, but both have now long been things of the past. Contest between representatives of summer and winter among the Eskimos Among the central Eskimos in North America, the contest between representatives of summer and winter, which in Europe has long degenerated into a mere dramatic performance, is still kept up as a magical ceremony which the avowed intention is to influence the weather. In autumn, when storms announce the approach of the dismal Arctic winter, the Eskimos divide themselves into two parties, called respectively the Ptarmigans and the Ducks. The Ptarmigans comprising all persons born in winter, and the Ducks all persons born in summer. A long rope of seal skin is then stretched out, and each party laying hold of one end of it, seeks by tugging with might and main to drag the other party over to its side. If the Ptarmigans get the worst of it, then summer has won the game and fine weather may be expected to prevail throughout the winter. In this ceremony it is clearly assumed that persons born in summer have a natural affinity with warm weather, and therefore possess the power of mitigating the rigour of winter, whereas persons born in winter are, so to say, of a cold and frosty disposition, and can thereby exert a refrigerating influence on the temperature of the air. In spite of this natural antipathy between the representatives of summer and winter, we may be allowed to conjecture then the grand tug of war, the Tumigans do not pull at the rope with the same hearty goodwill as the ducks, and that thus the general influence of summer calmly prevails over the harsh austerity of winter. The Indians in Canada seem also to have imagined that persons are endowed with distinct and natural capacities according as they are born in summer or winter, and they turn to distinction to account in much the same fashion as the Eskimos. When they wearied of the long frosts and the deep snow which kept them prisoners in their huts and prevented them from hunting, 
all of them born in summer, rushed out of their houses, armed with burning brands and torches, which they hurled against the one who makes window, and this was supposed to produce the desired effect of mitigating the cold. But those Indians who were born in winter abstained from taking part in the ceremony, for they believed that if they meddled with it, the cold would increase instead of diminishing. We may surmise, then, the corresponding European ceremonies which have just been described. It was formerly deemed necessary that the actors who played the parts of winter and summer should have been born in the seasons which they personated. The Burning of Winter at Zurich Every year of the Monday after the spring equinox, boys and girls attired in gay costume flock at a very early hour into Zurich from the country. The girls generally clad in white are called Marielis, and carry two and two a small may tree, or a wreath decked with flowers and ribbons. Thus they go in bands from house to house, jingling the bells which are attached to the wreath, and singing a song, in which it is said that the Marielis dance because the leaves and the grass are green and everything is bursting into blossom. In this way they are supposed to celebrate the triumph of summer and to proclaim his coming. The boys are called Bogen. They generally wear over their ordinary clothes a shirt decked with many coloured ribbons, tall pointed paper caps on their heads, and masks before their faces. In this quaint costume they cart about through the streets effigies made of straw and other combustible materials, which are supposed to represent winter. At evening these effigies are burned in various parts of the city. The ceremony was witnessed at Zurich on Monday, April 20th, 1903, by my friend Dr. J. Southern Black, who has kindly furnished me with some notes on the subject. The effigy of winter was a gigantic figure composed in great part, as it seemed, of cotton wool. This was laid on a huge pyre, about 30 feet high, which had been erected on the Saddlesplatz close to the lake. In presence of a vast concourse of people, fire was set to the pyre, and all was soon in a blaze. While the town bells rang a joyous peal, as a figure gradually consumed in the flames, the mechanism enclosed in its interior produced a variety of grotesque effects, such as a gushing forth of bowels. At last nothing remained of the effigy but the iron backbone. The crowd slowly dispersed, and the fire brigade set to work to quench the smouldering embers. In this ceremony, the contest between summer and winter is rather implied than expressed, but the significance of the rite is unmistakable. Part 8. Death and Resurrection of Kostrobongo Funeral of Kostrobongo, Kostroma, Kapolo, and Yarilo in Russia In Russia, funeral ceremonies like those of burying the carnival and carrying out death are celebrated under the names not of death or the carnival, but of certain mythic figures, Kostrobongo, Kostroma, Kapalo, Lesia, and Yadrolo. These Russian ceremonies are observed both in spring and at midsummer. Thus in Little Russia, it used to be the custom at Eastertide to celebrate the funeral of a being called Kostrobongo, the deity of the spring. A circle was formed of singers who moved slowly around a girl who lay on the ground, as if dead, and as they went they sang, Dead, dead is our Kostrobongo, dead, dead is our dear one. Until the girl suddenly sprang up, on which the chorus joyfully exclaimed, Come to life, come to life, has our Kostrobongo. Come to life, come to life, has our dear one. On the eve of St. John, Midsummer's Eve, a figure of Capello is made of straw and is dressed in women's clothes with a necklace and a floral crown. Then a tree is felled, and after being decked with ribbons, is set up on some chosen spot. Near this tree, to which they give the name of Arena, Winter or Death, the straw figure is placed together with a table on which stand spirits and fans. Afterwards a bonfire is lit, and the young men and maidens jump over it in couples, carrying the figure with them. On the next day they strip the tree and the figure of the ornaments, and throw them both into a stream. On St. Peter's Day, the 29th of June, on the following Sunday, the funeral of Kostroma or of Lady, or of Yurilo, is celebrated in Russia. In the government of Penza and Simbrisk, the funeral used to be represented as follows. A bonfire was kindled on the 28th of June, and the next day the maidens chose one of their number to play the part of Kostroma. Her companions saluted her with deep obeisances, placed her on a board, and carried her to the bank of a stream. There they bathed her in the water, 
or the oldest girl made a basket of lime tree bark and beat it like a drum. Then they returned to the village and ended the day with processions, games and dances. In the Moram district of Kostroma was represented by a store figure dressed in women's clothes and flowers. This was laid in a trough and carried with songs to the bank of a lake or river. Here the crowd divided into two sides, of which one attacked the other, defending the figure. At last the assailants gained the day, stripped the figure of its dress and ornaments, tore it in pieces, trod the straw of which it was made underfoot, and flung it into the stream. While the defenders of the figure hid their faces in their hands, and pretended to be way of the deaf as Kostroma. In the district of Kostroma, the burial of Yarello was celebrated on the 29th or 13th of June. The people chose an old man, gave him a small coffin containing a prepress like figure representing Yarello. This he carried out of the town, followed by women chanting dirges and expressing by their gestures grief and despair. In the open fields, a grave was dug, and into it the figure was lowered mid weeping and wailing out of which games and dances were begun. Calling to mind the funeral games celebrated in old times by the pagan Slavonians. In Little Russia, the figure of Irillo was laid on a coffin and carried through the streets after sunset, surrounded by drunken women, who kept repeating mournfully, He is dead, he is dead. The men lifted and shook the figure as if they were trying to recall the dead man alive. And they said to the women, Women, weep not, I know what is sweeter than honey. But the women continued to lament and chant, as they do at funerals. Of what was he guilty? He was so good. He will arise no more. Oh, how shall we part from he? What is life without thee? Arise if only for a brief hour. But he rises not, he rises not. Alas, Urillo was buried in a grave. Part 9. Death and Revival of Vegetation The Russian Krostobongo, Yarillo, and so on, were probably at first, spirits of vegetation dying and coming to life again. These Russian customs are plainly of the same nature as those which in Austria and Germany are known as carrying out death. Therefore the interpretation here adopted of the latter is right. The Russian Kostrobongo, Yarillo, and the rest must also have been originally embodiments of the spirit of vegetation, and that death must have been regarded as a necessary preliminary for their revival. The revival as a sequel to the death is enacted in the first of the ceremonies described, the death and resurrection of Kostrobongo. The reason why in some of these Russian ceremonies the death of the spirit of vegetation is celebrated midsummer may be the decline of summer is dated for midsummer day, out of which the days begin to shorten and the sun sets out on its downward journey to the darksome hollows where the frosts of winter lie. Such a turning point of the year, when vegetation might be thought to share the insipid, though almost imperceptible, decay of summer, might very well be chosen by primitive man as a fit moment for restoring to those magic rites by which he hopes to stay the decline, or at least to ensure the revival of plant life. In these ceremonies, grief and gladness, love and hatred appear to be curiously combined. But while the death of vegetation appears to have been represented in all, and its revival in some, of these spring and midsummer ceremonies, there are features in some of them which can hardly be explained on this hypothesis alone. The solemn funeral, the lamentations, and the mourning attire, which often characterise these rites, are indeed appropriate at the death for the beneficent spirit of vegetation. But what shall we say of the glee with which the effigy is often carried out, of the sticks and stones with which it is assailed, and the taunts and curses which are hurled at it. What shall we say of the dread of the effigy, evinced by the haste in which the bearers scamper home as soon as they are thrown away, and by the belief that some one must soon die in any house into which it has looked? This dread might perhaps be explained by a belief that there is a certain infectiousness in the dead spirit of vegetation which renders its approach dangerous. But this explanation, besides being rather strained, does not cover the rejoicings which often attend the carrying out of death. We must therefore recognise two distinct and seemingly opposite features in these ceremonies. On the one hand, sorrow for the deaf and affection and respect for the dead. On the other hand, fear and hatred of the dead and the rejoicings at his death. How the former of these features is to be explained, I have attempted to show. How the latter came to be so closely associated with the former is a question which I shall try to answer in the sequel. 
expulsion of death sometimes enacted without an effigy. Before we quit these European customs and go further afield, it will be well to notice that occasionally the expulsion of death of a mythic being is conducted without any visible representative of the personage expelled. There's a Kosingan near Gulitz in Silesia. All the villagers, young and old, used to go out with stored torches to the top of a neighbouring hill called Tontenstein, Death Stone, where they lit their torches and so returned home seeing, We have driven out death. We are bringing back summer. In Albania, young people light torches of resinous woods on Easter Eve and march a procession through the village brandishing them. At last they throw the torches into the river, saying, Ha, Kur, we fling you into the river like these torches, and you may return no more. Some say that the intention of the ceremony is to drive out winter, but Kur is conceived as a malignant being who devours children. Part 10. Anagolus writes in India. Images of Siva and Parvati, married, drowned, and mourned for in India. In the Kanagra district of India, there is a custom observed by young girls in the spring which closely resembles some of the European spring ceremonies just described. It is called the Rally Mantha, or Fair of Rally, the Rally being a small painted earthen image of Siva or Parvati. The custom is in vogue all over the Kanagra district, and its celebration, which is entirely confined to young girls, lasts through most of Chet, March April, up to the Sanskrit of Besa, April. On a morning in March, all the young girls of the village take some baskets of dub, grass, and flowers to an appointed place, where they throw them in a heap. Round this heap they stand in a circle and sing. This goes on every day for ten days, till the heap of grass and flowers has reached a fair height. Then they cut in the jungle two branches, each with three prongs at one end and place them, prongs downwards, over the heap of flowers, so as to make two tripods or pyramids. On the single uppermost points of these branches, they get an image maker to construct two early images, one to represent Siva and the other Parvati. The girls then divide themselves into two parties, one for Siva and one for Parvati, and marry the images in the usual way, leaving out no part of the ceremony. After the marriage, they have a feast, the cost of which is defrayed by a contribution solicited from their parents. Then, at the next Sanskrit, basic, they all go together to the riverside, throw the images into a deep pool, and weep over the place, as though they were performing funeral obsequies. The boys in the neighbourhood often tease them by diving after the images, bringing them up, and waving them about while the girls are crying over them. The object of the fair is said to be to secure a good husband. In this Indian custom, Siva and Parvati seem to be the equivalents of the King and Queen of May. That in this Indian ceremony, the deities Siva and Parvati are conceived as spirits of vegetation, seems to be proved by the placing of their images on branches over a heap of grass and flowers. Here is often in European folk custom, the divinities of vegetation are represented in duplicate by plants and by puppets. The marriage of these Indian deities in spring corresponds to the European ceremonies, in which the marriage of the vernal spirits of vegetation is represented by the king and queen of May, the May bride, bridegroom of May, and so forth. The throwing of these images into the water and the mourning for them are the equivalents of the European customs of throwing the dead spirit of vegetation under the name of death. Yerilo, Kostroma, and the rest into the water, lamenting over it. Again in India, as often in Europe, the rite is performed exclusively by females. The notion that the ceremony helps to recure husbands for the girls can be explained by the quickening and fertilizing influence which the spirit of vegetation is believed to exert upon the life of man as well as of plants. Part 11. The Magic Spring the foregoing customs were originally rites intended to ensure the revival of nature in spring by means of imitative magic. The general explanation which we have been led to adopt of these and many similar ceremonies is that they are, or were in their origin, magical rites intended to ensure the revival of nature in spring. The means by which they were supposed to effect this end were imitation and sympathy. Led astray by his ignorance of the true causes of things, primitive man believed that in order to produce the great phenomena of nature on which his life depended, he had only to imitate them, 
and that immediately by a secret sympathy or mystic influence the little drama which he acted in forest glade or mountain dell on desert plain or windswept shore would be taken up and repeated by mightier actors on a vaster stage he fancied that by masquerading in leaves and flowers he helped the bare earth to close herself with verdure and that by playing the death and burial winter he drove that gloomy season away and made smooth the pass for the footsteps of returning spring we find it hard to throw ourselves even in fancy into a mental condition in which such things seem possible we can more easily picture to ourselves the anxiety which the savage when he first began to lift his thoughts above the satisfaction of his merely animal wants and to meditate on the cause of things may have felt as the continual operation of what we now call the laws of nature to us familiar as we are with the conception of the uniformity and regularity with which the great cosmic phenomena succeed each other there seems little ground for apprehension that the causes which produce these effects will cease to operate at least within the near future but this confidence in the stability of nature is bred only by the experience which comes of wide observation and long tradition and the savage with his arrow sphere of observation and his short lived tradition lacks the very elements of that experience which alone could set his mind at rest in face of the ever changing and often menacing aspects of nature. No wonder, therefore, that he is thrown into a panic by an eclipse, and thinks that the sun of the moon would surely perish if he did not raise a clamour and shoot his puny shafts into the air, or defend the luminaries from the monster who threatened to devour them. No wonder he is terrified when, in the darkness of night, a streak of sky is suddenly illuminated by the flash of a meteor, or the whole expanse of the celestial arch grows with the fitful light of the northern streamers. Even phenomena which recur at fixed and uniform intervals may be viewed by him with apprehension, before he has come to recognise the orderliness of their recurrence. The speed or slowness of his recognition of such periodic or cyclic changes in nature would depend largely on the length of the particular cycle. The cycle, for example, of day and night is everywhere, except in the polar regions, so short and hence so frequent that men probably soon cease to discompose themselves seriously as to the chance of failing to recur. Though the ancient Egyptians, as we have seen, daily wrought enchantments to bring back to the east in the morning the fiery orb which had sunk at evening in the crimson west. Feelings with which the primitive savages may have regarded the changes of the seasons. But it was far otherwise with the annual cycle of the seasons. To any man a year is a considerable period, seeing the number of our years is but a few at the best. To the primitive savage, with his short memory and imperfect means of marking the flight of time, a year may well have been so long that he failed to recognise it as a cycle at all, and watch the changing aspects of earth and heaven with a perpetual wonder, alternately delighted and alarmed, elated and cast down, according as vicissitudes of light and heat, or planted animal life, minister to his comfort or threaten his existence. In autumn, when the withered leaves were whirled about the forest by the nipping blast, and he looked up at the bare boughs, could he feel sure that they would ever be green again? As day by day the sun sank lower and lower in the sky, could he be certain that Luminary would ever retrace his heavenly road? Even the waning moon, whose pale sickle rose thinner and thinner every night over the rim of the eastern horizon, may have excited in his mind a fear lest, when it had wholly vanished, there should be moons no more. In modern Europe, the old magical rites for the revival of nature in spring have degenerated into mere pageants and pastimes. These and a thousand such misgivings may have thronged the fancy and troubled the peace of the man who first began to reflect on the mysteries of the world we lived in, and to take thought for a more distant future than the morrow. It was natural, therefore, there were such thoughts and fears he should have done all that in him lay to bring back the fate of blossom to the bough to swing the low sun of winter up to his old place in the summer sky, and restore its old fullness to the silver lamp of the waning moon. We may smile at his vain endeavours if we please, but it was only by making a long series of experiments, of which some were almost inevitably doomed to failure, the man learned from experience the futility of some of his attempted methods and the frivolness of others. After all, magical ceremonies are nothing but experiments which have failed and which continue to be repeated merely because, for reasons which have already been indicated, the operator is unaware of their failure. 
With the advance of knowledge, these ceremonies either cease to be performed altogether, or are kept up from force of habit long after the intention of which they were instituted has been forgotten. Thus fallen from their high estate, no longer regarded as solemn rites on the punishable forms of which the welfare and even the life of the community depend, they sink gradually to the level of simple pageants, mummeries and pastimes, till in the final stage of degeneration they are wholly abandoned by older people, and, from having once been the most serious occupation of the sage, become at last the idle sport of children. It is in this final stage of decay that most of the old magical rites of our European forefathers linger on at the present day, and even from their last retreat, they have fast been swept away by the rising tide of those multitudinous forces, moral, intellectual and social, which are bearing mankind onwards to a new and unknown goal. We may feel some natural regret at the disappearance of quaint customs and picturesque ceremonies, which are reserved to an age often deemed dull and prosaic, something of the flavour and freshness of the olden time. Some breath of the springtime of the world, yet our regret will be lessened when we remember that these pretty pageants, these now innocent diversions, had their origin in ignorance and superstition, that if they are a record of human endeavour, they are almost a monument of fruitless ingenuity, of wasted labour, and of blighted hopes, and that for all their gay trappings, their flowers, their ribbons, and their music, they partake far more of tragedy than of farce. Parallel to the spring customs of Europe in the magical rites of the Central Australian Aborigines. The interpretation which, following in the footsteps of W. Manhart, I have attempted to give of these ceremonies, has been not a little confirmed by the discovery, made since this book was first written, that the natives of Central Australia regularly practice magical ceremonies for the purpose of awakening the dormant energies of nature at the approach of what may be called the Australian Spring. Nowhere apparently are the alternations of the seasons more sudden and the contrast between them more striking than in the deserts of central Australia, where at the end of a long period of drought, the sandy and stony wilderness over which the silence and desolation of death appear to brood, is suddenly, after a few days of torrential rain, transformed into a landscape smiling with verdure and peopled with teeming multitudes of insects and lizards, of frogs and birds. The marvellous change which passes over the face of nature at such times has been compared even by European observers to the effect of magic. No wonder, then, that the savage should regard it as such. In very deed, now it is just when there is promise of the approach of a good season that the natives of Central Australia are wont especially to perform these magical ceremonies of which the avowed intention is to multiply the plants and animals they use as food. These ceremonies, therefore, present a close analogy to the spring customs of our European peasantry, not only in the time of their celebration, but also in their aim. For we can hardly doubt that institution rites designed to assist the revival of plant life in spring are primitive forefathers removed, not by any sentimental wish to smell at early violets, or pluck at the wraith primrose, or watch yellow daffodils dancing in the breeze, but by the very practical consideration, certainly not formulated in abstract terms, that the life of man is inextricably bound up with that of plants, and that if they would perish, he could not survive. And as the faith of the Australian savage in the effigy of his magic rites is confirmed by observing that their performance is invariably followed sooner or later by that increase of vegetable and animal life which it is their object to produce, so we may suppose it was with the European savages in the olden time. A sight of the fresh green and breaking thicket, or vernal flowers blowing on mossy banks, or swallows arriving from the south and the sun mounting daily higher in the sky, would be welcomed by them as so many visible signs that their enchantments were indeed taking effect, and would inspire them with a cheerful confidence that all was well with the world with which they could thus mould to suit their wishes. Only in autumn days, as summer slowly faded, will their confidence again be dashed by doubts and misgivings as symptoms of decay, which told in vain were all their effects to stave off forever the approach of winter and of death. End of section 13section 14 of the golden bow part 3 the dying god by sir james george fraser this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey note a chinese indifference to death letter of mr m w lampson 
Lord Avery kindly allows me to print the letter of Mr. M. W. Lamson, referred to above, page 146, note 1. It runs as follows. Foreign Office, August 7th, 1903. Dear Lord Averbury, as a result of inquiries, I hear from a Mr. Eames, a lawyer who practiced for some years at Shanghai, has considerable knowledge of Chinese matters, that for a small sum, a substitute can be found for execution. This is recognized by the Chinese authorities with certain exemptions, as for instance, parricide. It is even asserted that the local Taotai gains pecuniarily by this arrangement, as he is as a rule, not above obtaining a substitute for the condemned man, for a less sum than was paid him by the latter. It is, I believe, part of the doctrine of Confucius, that is, one of the highest virtues to increase the family prosperity at the expense of personal suffering. According to Eames, the Chinamen, sick, look upon execution in other man's steed in this light, and consequently there is quite a competition for such a substitution. Should you wish to get more definite information, he addresses W. Eames, Esquire, C.O., Norman Craig, Inner Temple, E.C. The only man in this department who has actually been out to China is at present away, but on his return, I'll ask him about it. He was sincerely, Miles W. Lamson. Lord Averbury's Statement On this subject, Lord Averbury has stated, It is said that in China, if a rich man is condemned to death, he can sometimes purchase a willing substitute at a very small expense. In regard to his authority for this statement, Lord Averbury wrote to me, August 10th, 1903. I believe my previous information came from Sir T. Wade, but I have been able to lay my hand on his letter, and do not, therefore, like to state it as a fact. Sir Thomas Wade was English ambassador at Peking, and afterwards professor of Chinese at Cambridge. Opinions of Various Authorities on the same subject, Mr. Valentine Chirol, editor of the Foreign Department of the Times, wrote to me as follows. Queen Anne's Mansion, Westminster, SW, August 21st, 1905. Dear Sir, I shall be very glad to do what I can to obtain for you the information you require. It was a surprise to me to hear that the accuracy of this statement was called in question. It is certainly a matter of common report in China that the practice exists. The difficulty, I conceive, will be to obtain evidence enabling one to quote concrete cases. My own impression is that the practice is quite justifiable, according to Chinese ethics, when life is given up from motives of filial piety, that is to say, in order to relieve the wants of indignant parents, or to defray the costs of ancestral rights. Sick. Your general thesis that life is less valued and more readily sacrificed by some races than by modern Europeans seems to be beyond dispute. Surely the Japanese practice of Seppuku, or Harikari, as it is vulgarly called, is a case in point. Life is risked, as in dueling by Europeans, for the mere point of honour, but is never deliberately laid down in satisfaction of the exigencies of the social code. I will send you whatever information I can obtain when it reaches me, but that will not, of course, be for some months. Yours truly, Valentine Charol. P.S. A friend of mine who has just been here entirely confirms my own belief as to the accuracy of your statement, and tells me he has himself seen several imperial decrees in the Peking Gazette, calling provincial authorities to order for having allowed specific cases of substitution to occur, and ordering the death penalty be carried out in a more severe form on the original culprits as an extra punishment for obtaining substitutes. He has promised to look up some of these imperial decrees on his return to China, and send me translation. I am satisfied personally that his statement is conclusive. V.C. On the same subject, I have received the following letter from Mr. J.O.P. Bland, for 14 years correspondent of the Times in China. The Clock House, Shepparton, March 22, 1911. Dear Professor Fraser, my friend Mr. Valentine Chirol, writing the other day from Crete on his way east, asked me to communicate with you on the subject of your letter on the third alto namely, the custom, alleged to exist in China, of procuring substitutes for persons condemned to death. The substitutes, families or relatives are receiving compensation in cash. To speak of this as a custom is to exaggerate the frequency of a class of incident, which has undoubtedly been recorded in China, and of which there has been mentioned imperial decrees. I am sorry to say that I have not my file on the Peking Gazette here, for immediate reference, but I am writing to my friend, Mr. Backhouse in Peking, 
and have no doubt that he will be able to give chapter and verse of instances best recorded. I have expected to find cases of the kind recorded in Mr. Wuner's recently published Descriptive Sociology of the Chinese. Spencerian Publications but I have not been able to do so in the absence of an index of that voluminous work. More than one of the authors whom he quotes have certainly referred to cases of substitution for death sentence prisoners. Barker, for instance, China Past and Present, page 378, asserts that substitutes were to be had in Canton at the reasonable price of 50 tails, say, 10 pounds. Dr. Matignon, in Superstition, Crime et Misere en Chain, page 113, says that filial piety is a frequent motive. The negative opinion of professors, Gilles and de Groot is entitled to consideration, but cannot be regarded as any more conclusive than the views expressed by Professor Gilles on the question of infanticide, which are outweighed by a mass of direct proof of eyewitnesses. In a country when men substitute voluntarily to mutilation and grave risk of death for a comparatively small gain to themselves and their relatives, where women commit suicide in hundreds to escape capture by invaders or strangers, where men and women alike habitually sacrifice their life for the most trivial motives of revenge or distress. It need not greatly surprise us that some should be found, especially among the wretchedly poor class, willing to give up their life in order to relieve their families of want, otherwise to acquire merit. The most important thing, I think, is expressing any opinion about the Chinese, is to remember the great extent and heterogeneous elements of the country and to abstain from any sweeping generalizations based on isolated acts or events. He was very truly J.O.P. Bland. As the practice in question involves a grave miscarriage of justice, the discovery which might entail serious consequences on the magistrate who connived at it, we need not wonder that it is generally hushed up, and that no instance of it should come to the ears of many Europeans resident in China. My friend Professor H. A. Gills of Cambridge, in conversation, expressed himself quite incredulous on the subject, and Professor J. J. M. de Groot of Leyden wrote to me, January 31st, 1902, to the same effect. The Reverend Dr. W. T. A. Barber, headmaster of the Lay School, Cambridge, and formerly missionary in China, wrote to me, January 30th, 1902, as the possibility that a man condemned to death may secure a substitute on payment of a moderate sum of money we used to hear that this was the case, but I have no proof that it would justify you in using the fact. Another experienced missionary, the Reverend W. A. Hornaby, wrote to Dr. Barber, I have heard of no such custom in capital crimes. A man whose house the fire starts may, and often does, pay another to receive the blows, and three days in a cane. But unless we have foreign rights were the case, and a bravely condemned criminal handy, I should hardly think it possible. Every precaution is taken that no one is beheaded but the man who cannot possibly be let off. The expense on the country Mandarin is over £100 in satisfactory expenses with higher courts. On this I would observe that if every execution costs local Mandarin so dear, he must be under a strong temptation to get the expenses out of the prisoner whenever he can do so without being detected. Substitutes for Corporal Punishment in China With regard to the custom mentioned by Mr. Cornaby, of procuring substitutes for corporal punishment, we are told in China there are men who earn a livelihood by being thrashed instead of the real culprits. But they bribe the execution to lay on lightly, otherwise their constitution could not long resist the tear and wear of so exhausting a profession. Thus the theory and practice of vicarious suffering is well understood in China. Note B. Swinging as a Magical Rite the custom of swinging practiced for various reasons. The custom of swinging has been practiced as a religious or rather magical rite in various parts of the world, but it does not seem possible to explain all the instances of it in the same way. People appear to have resorted to the practice from different motives and with different ideas of the benefit to be derived from it. Swinging at Harvest in the text we have seen that the Letts, and perhaps the Siamese, swing to make the crops grow tall. The same may be the intention of the ceremony whenever it is specially observed at harvest festivals. Among the Burgenese and Makassars of Salibs, for example, it used to be the custom for young girls to swing one after the other on these occasions. At the great Deserta festival in Nepal, which immediately precedes the cutting of the rice, swings and kites come into fashion among the young people of both sexes, the swings are sometimes hung from boughs of trees. 
but generally from a cross beam supported on a framework of tall bamboos. Among the diaks of Sarawak, a feast is held at the end of harvest, when the soul of the rice is secured to prevent the crops from running away. On this occasion, a number of old women rock to and fro on a rude swing suspended from the rafters. A traveller in Sarawak has described how he saw many tall swings erected and diaks swinging to and fro on them, sometimes ten or twelve men together on one swing, while they chanted in monotonous, doge-like tones in invocation to the spirits that they would be pleased to grant a plentiful harvest of sago and fruit and a good fishing season. Swinging for Fish and Game In the East Indian island of Benkali, elaborate and costly ceremonies are performed to ensure a good catch of fish. Among the rest, an hereditary princess, who bears the royal title of Dingjang Raja, works herself up by means of the fumes of incense and so forth into that state of mental disorder with which many people passes for a symptom of divine inspiration. In the pious frame of mind, she is led by her four handmaids through a swing all covered with yellow and hung with golden bells, which she takes her seat amid the jingle of the bells. As she walks gently to and fro in the swing, she speaks in an unknown tongue to each of the sixteen spirits who have to do with the fishing. Nor to procure a plentiful supply of game, the Tina Indians of Northwest America perform a magical ceremony which they call the young man bound or tied. They pinion a man totally and having hung him by the head and heels from the roof of the hut, rock him backwards and forwards. Thus we see that people swing in order to procure a plentiful supply of fish and game, as well as good crops. In such cases, the notion seems to be that this ceremony promotes fertility, whether in the vegetable or the animal kingdom, though why it should be supposed to do so, I confess myself unable to explain. Indian customers swinging on hooks. There seem to be some reasons for thinking that the Indian writers swinging on hooks run through the flesh of the performer is also resorted to, at least in some cases, from relief in its fertilizing virtue. Thus Hamilton tells us that at Karwar, on the west coast of India, a feast is held at the end of May or beginning of June in honour of the infernal gods, with a divination or conjuration to know the fate of the ensuring crop of corn. Men were hung from a pole by means of tender hooks inserted in the flesh of their backs, and the pole with the men dangling from it was then dragged for more than a mile over ploughed ground onto one sacred grove to another preceded by a young girl who carried a pot of fire on her head. When the second grove was reached, the men were let down and taken off the hooks, and the girl fell into the usual prophetic frenzy, out of which she unfolded to the priest the revelation with which she had just been favoured by the terrestrial gods. In each of the groves a shapeless black stone, dulled with red lead to stand for a mouth, eyes and ears, appears to have represented the indwelling divinity. Sometimes this custom of swinging on hooks, which is known among the Hindus as Churik Puja, seems to be intended to propagate demons. Some Santos asked Mr. V. Ball to be allowed to perform because their women and children were dying of sickness and their cattle were being killed by wild beasts. They believe that these misfortunes befell them because the evil spirits had not been appeased. These same Santos celebrate a swinging festival of a less barbarous sort by the month of February. Eight men sit in chairs or rotate round posts in a sort of revolving swing, like the merry rounds which are so dear to children at English fairs. At Noroz and Ed, festivals in Dardistan, the women swing on ropes suspended from trees. Swinging in the rainy season During the rainy season in Bihar, young women swing in their houses, or they sing songs appropriate to the season. The period during which they indulge in this pastime, if a mere pastime it be, is strictly limited. It begins with a festival which usually falls on the 25th of the month jet, and ends with another festival which commonly takes place on the 25th of the month asin. No one would think of swinging at any other time of the year. It is possible that this last custom may be nothing more than a pastime meant to while away some of the tedious hours of the inclement season. But its limitation to a certain, clearly defined portion of the year seems rather to point to a religious or magical origin. Possibly the intention 
may once have been to drive away the rain. We shall see immediately that swinging is sometimes resorted to for the purpose of explaining the powers of evil. Swing in honour of Krishna About the middle of March, the Hindus observe a swinging festival of a different sort in honour of the god Krishna, whose image is placed in the seat or cradle of a swing, and then, just when the dawn is breaking, walk gently to and fro several times. The same ceremony is repeated at noon and at sunset. In the Rigveda, the sun is called, by a natural metaphor, the golden swing in the sky, and the expression helps us to understand a ceremony in Vedic India. A priest sat in a swing and touched with the span of his right hand at once the seat of the swing and the ground. In doing so, he said, the great lord has united himself with the great lady. The god has united himself with the goddess. Is only in custom of swinging at the summer solstice. Perhaps he meant to indicate in a graphic way that the sun has reached the lowest point of its course, where it was nearest to the earth. In this connection, it is of interest to note that in the Estonian celebration of St. John's Day, on the summer softer swings play, along with bonfires, the most prominent part. Girls sit and swing the whole night through, singing old song to explain why they do so. The legend tells of an Estonian prince who wooed and won an Islandic princess. But a wicked enchanter spirited away the lover to a desert island, where he languished in captivity, till his lady love contrived to break the magic spell that bound him. Together they sailed home to Estonia, which they reached on St. John's Day, and burnt their ship, resolved to stay no longer in far foreign lands. The swings of which the Estonian maidens still rocked themselves on St. John's Day are said to recall the ship in which the lovers tossed upon the stormy sea, and the bonfires commemorate the burning of it. When the fires have died out, the swings are laid aside and never used again, either in the village or at the solitary alehouse until spring comes round once more. Here is natural to connect both swings and bonfires with the apparent course of the sun, who reaches the highest and turning point of his orbit on St. John's Day. Bonfires and swings perhaps were originally charms intended to kindle the speed afresh on its heavenly road, the golden swing in the sky. Among the Letts of South Livonia and Curland, the summer solstice is the occasion of a great festival of flowers, at which the people sing songs with the constant refrain of Ligo Ligo. It has been proposed to derive the word Ligo from the Lettish verb Ligot, to swing, with reference to the sun swinging in the sky at this turning point of his course. Swinging for Inspiration At Tengariong, in eastern Borneo, the priests and priestesses receive the inspiration of the spirits seated in swings and rocking themselves to and fro. Thus suspended in the air, they appear to be in a peculiarly favourable position for catching the divine afflatus. One end of the plank which forms the seat of the priest's swing is carved in the rude likeness of a crocodile's head. The swing of the priestess is similarly ornamented with a serpent's head. Swing as a cure for sickness Again, swings are used for the cure of sickness but it is the doctor who rocks himself in them, not the patient. In North Borneo, the diag medicine man will sometimes erect a swing in front of the sick man's house and sway backwards and forwards on it for the purpose of kicking away the disease, frightening away evil spirits, and catching the stray soul of the sufferer. Clearly in his passage through the air, the physician is likely to collide with the disease and the evil spirits, both of which are sure to be loitering about in the neighbourhood of the patient, and the rude shock thus given to the malady and the demons may reasonably be expected to push or hustle them away. In Tengeriong, in eastern Borneo, a traveller witnessed a ceremony for the expulsion of an evil spirit in which swinging played a part. After four men in blue shirts, bespangled with stars and wearing coronets of red cloth decorated with beads and bells, had sought diligently for the devil, rally about on the floor and grunting with awe, three hideous hags dressed in faded, Red petticoats were brought in with great pomp, carried on the shoulders of the Malays, and took their seats amid solemn silence on the cradle of a swing, the ends of which were carved to represent the head and tail of a crocodile. Not a sound escaped from the crowd of spectators during this awe-inspiring ceremony. They regarded the business as most serious. The venerable dames then rocked to and fro on the swing, fanning themselves languidly with the Chinese paper fans. At a later stage of the performance, 
They and three girls discharged burning arrows at a sort of altar of banana leaves, maize and grass. This completed the discomiture of the devil. Athenian Festival of Swinging The Athenians in antiquity celebrated an annual festival of swinging. Boys were hung from trees by ropes, and people sitting on them swung to and fro, while they sang songs of a loose or voluptuous character. The swinging went on both in public and private. Various explanations were given of the custom. The most generous seed was as follows. When Bacchus came among men to make known to them the pleasures of wine, he lodged with a certain Icarus or Icarius, to whom he revealed the precious secret and bade him go forth and carry the glad tidings to all the world. So Icarus loaded a wagon with wine skins and set out on his travels, the dog Mera running beside him. He came to Attica and there fell in with shepherds tending their sheep, to whom he gave of the wine. They drank greedily, but when some of them fell down dead drunk, their companions thought the stranger had poisoned them with intent to steal their sheep. So they knocked him on the head. The faithful dog ran home and guided his master's daughter, Erigone, to the body. At sight of it, she was smitten with despair and hanged herself on a tree beside her dead father. But not until she had prayed that, lest the Athenians should avenge her sire's murder, their daughters might die the same death as she. Her curse was fulfilled, for soon many Athenian damsels hanged themselves for no obvious reason. An oracle informed the Athenians of the true cause of this epidemic of suicide. So they sought out the bodies of the unhappy pair and instituted the swinging festival to appease Erikon. And, at the vintage, they offered the first of the grapes to her and her father. Swinging as a mode of expiation and purification. Thus, the swinging first world at Athens was regarded by the ancients as an expiation for a suicide or suicides by hanging. This opinion is strongly confirmed by a statement of Varro that it was unlawful to perform funeral rites in honour of persons who had died by hanging, but that in their case such rites were replaced by a custom of swinging images, as if in imitation of the death they had died. Servius says that the Athenians, failing to find the bodies of Icarus and Erigon on earth, made a pretense of seeking them in the air by swinging on ropes hung from trees, and he seems to have regarded the custom of swinging as a purification by means of air. This explanation probably comes very near the truth. Indeed, if we substitute souls or bodies in the wording of it, we may almost accept it as exact. It might be thought that the souls of persons who had died by hanging were more than the souls of the other dead, or in the air, since our bodies were suspended in air at the moment of death. Hence it would be considered needful to purge the air of these vagrant spirits, and this might be done by swinging persons or things to and fro, in order that by their impact might disperse and drive away the baleful ghosts. Thus the cuss would be exactly nugulous, on the one hand to the practice of the Malay medicine man, who swings to and fro in front of the patient's house in order to chase away the disease, or to frighten away evil spirits, or to catch a stray soul of the sick man, and on the other hand, to the practice of the Central Australian Aborigines, who beat the air with their weapons and hands in order to drive the lingering ghost away to the grave. At Rome, swing seemed to have formed part of the great Latin festival, Ferre Latine, and its origin was traced to a search in the air for the body of even the soul of King Latinus, who had disappeared from earth after the battle with Mesintius, King of Seir. Swing to promote the growth of plants. Yet on the other hand, there are circumstances which point to an intimate association, both at Athens and Rome, of these swinging festivals with an intention of promoting the growth of cultivated plants. Such circumstances are the legendary connection of the Athenian festival with Bacchus, the custom of offering the first fruits of the vintage to Aragon and Icarus, and at Rome the practice of hanging masks on trees at the time of sowing, in order to make the grapes grow better. Perhaps we can reconcile the two apparently discrepant effects attributed to swinging as a means of expiration on the one side and of fertilization on the other, by supposing that in both cases the intention is to clear the air of dangerous influences, whether these are ghosts of the unburied dead or spiritual powers immiscible to the growth of plants. Independent of both appears to be the notion that the higher you swing, the higher will grow the crops. This last is homeopathic or imitative magic, pure and simple, without any admixture 
of the ideas of purification or expiation. Swinging as a festival rite in modern Greece and Italy. In modern Greece and Italy, the custom of swinging as a festival rite, whatever its origin may be, is still observed in some places. At the small village of Kokura in Ellis, an English traveller observed peasants swinging from a tree in honour of St. George, whose festival it was. On the Tuesday after Easter, the maidens of Seraphos play their favourite game of the swing. They hang a rope from one wall to another of the steep, narrow, filly street, and putting some clothes on it, swing one after the other, singing as they swing. Young men who try to pass are called upon to pay toll in the shape of a penny, a song, and a swing. The words which the youth sings are generally these. The gold is swung, the silver is swung, and swung too is my love for the golden hair. To which the girl replies, Who is it that swings me, that I might gild him with my favour, that I may work him affairs all covered with pearls? In the Greek island of Carpathos, the villagers assemble at a given place on each of the four Sundays before Easter. A swing is erected, and the women swing one after the other, singing death wails such as they chant round the mimic tombs in church on the night of Good Friday. On Christmas Day, peasant girls in some villages of Calabria fasten ropes to iron rings on the ceiling and swing on them, while they sing certain songs prescribed by custom for the occasion. The practice is regarded not merely as an amusement, but also as an act of devotion. It is a custom in Cadiz, when Christmas comes, to fasten swings in the courtyards of houses, and even the houses themselves, when there is no room for them outside. In the evenings, lads and lasses assemble round the swings and pass the time happily in swing amid joyous songs and cries. The swings are taken down when carnivals come. The observance of the custom at Christmas, that is, at the winter solstice, suggests that in Calabria and Spain, as in Estonia, the pastime may originally have been a magical rite designed to assist the sun in climbing the steep ascent to the top of the summer sky. If this were so, we might surmise that the gold and the golden air mentioned by use and maidens of Seraphos as a swing refer to the golden swing in the sky. In other words, to the sun whose golden lamp swings daily across the blue vault of heaven. Swing at festivals in spring. However that may be, it would seem that festivals of swinging are especially held in spring. This is true, for example, of North Africa, where such festivals are common. At some places in that part of the world, the date of the swinging is the time of the apricots. At others, it is said to be the spring equinox. In some places the festival lasts three days, and the fathers who have had children born to them within the year bring them and swing them in the swings. In Korea, the fifth day of the fifth moon is called Tanonal. Ancestors are then worshipped, and swings are put up in the yards of most houses for the amusement of the people. The women on this day may go about the streets. During the rest of the year, they may go out only after dark. Dressed in their prettiest clothes, they visit the various houses and amuse themselves swinging. The swing is said to convey the idea of keeping cool in the approaching summer. It is one of the most popular feasts of the year. Perhaps the reason here is sign for swinging may explain other instances of the custom. On the principles of homeopathic magic, the swinging may be regarded as a means of ensuring a succession of cool, freshing breezes during the oppressive heat of the ensuing summer. End of section 14 And the end of The Golden Bow, Part 3, The Dying God, by Sir James George Fraser Read by Leon Harvey.